Good evening and welcome to The Woman Show. I'm Lunina Rasul. Tonight we're going to be speaking about a very difficult and uncomfortable topic, child sexual abuse. Now traditionally, parents have often warned their children away from speaking to strangers, going anywhere with someone they don't know, or taking anything from people they don't know. But the recent research has shown us that children are most in danger of abuse by someone that they know, or even someone within their own home. We've seen this play out in some of the most recent child abuse cases, that of Courtney Peters, that of Jeremiah Reiters, who were both raped and murdered by someone within their own home. Now, after the break, we're going to be speaking to a child sexual abuse survivor who has recently released a book documenting her experience. But before that, we went out and asked some people whether they think that we adequately protect our children and what more can be done about it. Let's hear what they had to say. With the justice system failing minor victims of sexual abuse and crime in general, we are obligated as adults and parents to be more observant and vigilant to protect our children. Children are different in every way and respond differently. Thus, we have to learn to listen to the child. Adults need to really take note of a change of behavior when it comes to our children because many times um, our children um, won't speak about it or speak out about it because they feel embarrassed or they feel um, guilty or shame. We should forget about the notion that children should be seen and not heard because we need to create that openness to our children where they feel free to come to us with any conversation, especially when it is something that can harm them. So we should let them know that their voice matters, their feelings matter, their opinion matters, so that they feel safe enough to come tell us when something is not right. Welcome back, you're still watching The Woman Show and with us in studio is Lynn Kirchhoff who is the author of My Shack, A Story of Hope. And Lynn's book has just been published and released to the public. Thank oh, you for joining us, Lynn. Thank you so much for the invitation. <laughs> Happy to be here. So Lynn, um, you are a child sexual abuse survivor. Correct. And this book details your journey from um, which started when you were 11 years old and you were at a party and something happened. Yeah. And so I think before we go into the dynamics to, to chat about child sexual abuse in general, yeah. maybe you want to give us a little bit of context around your story yeah. and what the book is about. Yeah, thank you. So it was, as you say, a party, but in, you know, in our culture, every gathering becomes a party when there's alcohol yeah. and there's dominoes. And so it was a typical, I think it was a Friday actually, uh, my sister and I accompanied my parents to a family gathering um, and on, uh, on the Cape Flats, which I'd speak about quite a bit in my book, it's known as a township. And mm. with a township, there's poverty, there's alcohol abuse, there's domestic violence. That's what Wikipedia says. That's what they classify townships as. Mm. Um, and no different in Silvertown, that's exactly what had happened. So it was a, a normal gathering, um, and there was a family member. And I had somehow suspected something wasn't okay. You sort of, I was 11, but I could feel something wasn't mm. okay. Um, but in those days, you don't sit with the adults. The children sit in a separate room because it's disrespectful to sit with the adults. Yes. And so my sister and I were led to the backroom TV um, and we, we watched TV and, you know, without giving too much detail, the uncle came in and I could see what was happening. Um, and before I knew it, I had asked him, I said, uncle, can I have a cool drink, please? the very question that changed my entire life. Um, and he said, sure, I can go fetch it at the back in the hockey. Um, hockey, I translated to my shack because yeah. it's in that very hockey, in that shack, um, that he sexually abused me. I hadn't known that he was following me. I had no idea. I was so focused on, on just getting his attention away from my sister. And I, you know, that just sort of happened. Um, 
and it was horrific. I asked for a cool drink as an 11 year old girl and I ended up as a victim of sexual abuse. Um, the ordeal in the shack itself, it felt like a lifetime. It felt as if time stood still. It felt as if everything in the room was just dark. It was colorless. And my body went completely lame and I knew in my mind what was happening was wrong. But I couldn't do anything. I was, I was just lame. I was, you know, when you watch these, I don't know, the puppets on the strings. Yeah. It was, it was that sort of effect where I was being controlled. Um, and I literally waited till it was done because I couldn't do anything. Um, and when it was done, I remember that I was sore and I just I felt absolutely dirty and I felt you know, I, I, I felt broken and I felt like I wasn't Lynn anymore and I walked back to the room very sore and I just fell onto the chair and I was like, oh, that's done. You know, that was the, the sort of experience with my shack. So the book does speak about, um, about that in detail, but also then just the journey that follows because that's when it happens. But there's just so many other emotions that accompany yeah. that. You know, um, and I, I went to the, the whole court procedure, going to the district surgeon um, and just rebelling in my teenage years and not knowing who you are because you blame yourself. Yes. And I, it's, can I just say before yeah, we get to court, yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting that you sort of the, the post analysis of it also, because um, you start out by saying that children um, and it's the way we were raised, you know, children yeah. were seen, they were not heard, they didn't yeah, speak to totally. adults. And this morning, actually, I was thinking about how, um, you know, you would be told to be, you would be shushed before the person even knew what totally. you wanted to ask. And I mean, that was a normal thing, mm. right? Don't, don't interrupt yeah, adults, yeah. etc. And so there is that thing. And then there are many stories from survivors where I hear they're not able to react because yeah. reacting is not just reacting against the abuse. You are going mm. against what an adult is, a, a big person, a big adult totally. is telling you what yeah. to do. And so in general, that's difficult to, it, to do it, anyway. it is. It is difficult, especially if your parents trust that person. Yes. Because it was at his house that we went to. And so that would mean that there's a trust relationship. And we'd been there many times before. Mm. So it was, could I say no to him? Mm. What would happen? Would my parents be angry if I said no to him? So all those, I mean, at, at that stage, I don't even remember all the thoughts that go through your mind. But certainly once it was done in, because I went home and it was obviously very late at the early hours of the morning. And I went straight to the bathroom and you wash you so hard that your skin is sore. And you get to bed and you can't sleep. And I, I, I explain how that was the first night of many, many nights that I cried myself to sleep. Because it's happened, but in your mind you still think, did that happen? Was that even real? You know, the trauma I think lost. And I think the disparity of the world still being normal. Yeah, you, you know, because totally. you still get up and go to, I often say with domestic violence, that yeah. was interesting because, you know, you'll have these big fights and your, your dad will beat your mom yeah. or whatever, but the next day you just, you, you go to school and totally. everything's normal. And, and, if, and, you know, if you actually act out, they'll tell you you're disrespectful. Mm -hmm. You can't act out, you can't, and God forbid you tell somebody because then you speak out to the house and that's, a, you know, that's another conversation on its own. So I think, and I think a lot of it is still true today. Yeah. I've spoken to many people since the release of the book. A lot of it is still true today. And I sit with the question of how do we change this? Yeah. I want to ask, Lynn, um, because, you know, part of, the, part of the point of the show also is to make systems um, and especially systems that exist to assist yeah. uh, victims of gender-based yeah. violence more visible. And so you took, um, it took a few months, but yeah. you eventually disclosed. Yeah. And you disclosed to a teacher. That's correct, yes. Um, so would you run through sort of what happened from there? Yeah, so I told the teacher on a Friday, not knowing what was going to happen after that. In my mind, I just couldn't keep the secret anymore. And I told her and I was like, I'd, I mean, I, I wept so much and she just held me and I'd felt better for that moment. And I thought that was it. Mm -hmm. Until before home time, she said, the principal needs to see me. 
and this big man that, you know, principals in primary school, you're normally a bit cautious with him. He had just become the softest person that I could have pictured in the office. And he said, Lynn, you know, Joan Abrams said, this is what you said, and we have to inform your parents. And I thought I was going to die mm. because I just, I didn't know what was going to happen. I was just so scared. Um, and he, I remember the school envelopes, so those brown envelopes, mm. and he had given it to me to give to my parents. And I got home and I gave it to my parents and nobody said anything. And that was how they informed your parents? Nobody said anything. I, I don't know if they had phoned, okay. but that is certainly, I think that's how they informed them. They didn't say anything. The house just went quiet. Um, it was probably the most uncomfortable <laughs> weekend I had, except for the Saturday, my mom's sister actually came down. And she called me, she was making sandwiches, and she said, Lynn, you know, you were a naughty little girl. Why didn't you tell your mommy? And I stood there, I thought, is this even happening? Did she just tell me that? And I, I didn't digest too much of it then, but in editing the book, I just realized the enormity of what she had told me. You know? It's I was just going to say, actually, because, you know, in, 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 in the way of disclosing also, so first you don't disclose, and the yeah. longer you don't disclose, the naughtier you yeah. feel, right? So it makes it, the more, the more yeah. you don't disclose, the more you can't disclose. Yeah, it's, it, it's such a, uh, yeah, it, it was horrible. But anyway, then from there, suddenly the social worker was at our house, the, I think the following week. And so it's a very tiring process because you have to tell your story in detail. And um, she asked lots of questions over and over again. And then once it's done, once everything is written, she says, okay, we're going to go over your story again. And she reads it and she says, did this happen? And how did this happen? And so it's, it, it, it just brings back all those memories mm -hmm. from there. Because I told the school it's a legal case that had to go to court. But before court, I had to go to the district surgeon, which was just humiliating. Um, my mom went with me. And obviously because of the strained relationship, my mom and I weren't really close then. Mm. But I remember laying down on the bed, first putting on this clinical gown and this tall, and I, I say it's a white man because when I was a young colored girl, I didn't know white people. They weren't in our circle. And so suddenly there's this, this doctor and he says, he's just going to just insert something. I must just be really quiet. I mustn't move. And there's this, I mean, this is an honest show. It was something that he put up that it was a long thing and you lay there and you're like, oh my gosh, I was sexually abused by a man. I come here and there's a man putting something in me. Given my mom was there, I was terrified. Mm -hmm. It was it was terrible. It was just, and they don't speak to you. They don't, um, they don't communicate with you. I don't know if he communicated to my mom, but it happened to me. And if I could have relayed what had happened in the shack, surely I had the brain to absorb what was happening to me. They could have spoken to me. Um, from there, the detectives come to your house before the court case. And again, there were two men. And you could, they were, you could see they were trying to be really gentle with me. They definitely were. But they kept coming unannounced. Mm. And so I wasn't ready. The one time I remember I was playing with my sister in the yard and we were playing in a bucket of water because it was hot. And so my mom said, oh, the detectives here must come. I wrapped a towel around me. And I sat there with wet clothing and a towel, and you suddenly just think, oh my gosh, you're not appropriately dressed. Especially after what you've been through, and they are you male, know. and... And they come and they write down again, and then they say, the social worker said this, and, and then they explained that it would have to go to court, and they explained a close court, I think that's what it's called, so there will be no witnesses, it will just be whoever needs to be in there. Um, so that was horrible, and then just the court case itself is just, I think, so, so the actual court case was horrible, but you know what just threw me completely? So it was in Athlone Court, and you have to find the court number on the door, and you walk, and as my mom and my dad walks with me, there the perpetrator sits right in front of me. There's no other way to walk but straight toward him. And he sat and he stared at me. 
And I wish I could tell you that I was strong at that time, but I felt so nervous. He had just, he had flawed it for me completely. And I think that was his intention. He wanted to humiliate me and he, it worked because I was, I was really scared. Um, but then I got into the courtroom and the teacher that I'd spoken to, um, she just held me and she said, it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. We're yelling. It's going to be okay. My parents were not able to show that love because I think they, they couldn't believe that this was actually happening and it was family. I mean, I think on their level, they had a whole different dynamic yeah. um, in terms of being com really very embarrassed, really humiliated, and also maybe blaming themselves for taking my sister and I there. So they weren't able to, to sort of provide the holding space that I needed specifically in court. Um, and again, in court, it was just men. It was the judge, it was the man, it was his attorney, it was him, it was my attorney, they were men. And yeah, taking the stand is, it's not easy. Um, how old, how long? I was 11 still. Okay. It was all the same here. Yeah, it was all the same here. Um, I, I don't think that um, victims speak out often because of that. Mm. Because even though it was a close court for me, you still had to take the stand. I said, it's like on the movies. <laughs> I remember the Bible and you still, you know, had to, you're going to be honest and stuff. And so um, the questions over and over. I cried so much, we had to do this recess thing mm -hmm. um, because I couldn't contain my emotions with being questioned all the time. And the question that stuck in my mind was, why didn't you tell your mommy and your daddy? Mm -hmm. Why didn't you shout no? And I kept trying to explain to him that I don't know why I didn't say no. I don't know at that stage why I didn't tell my parents. Um, I said maybe because they were both drunk, maybe everybody was drunk, maybe they weren't going to believe me, but at that stage, I don't know. And as I, as I grew up and I, I started you know, reading about survivors, yeah. it's such a, no, not the word normal, but that's what can happen, you can freeze. It's, it's your body's way of reacting to the trauma that you're experiencing. Mm. But in court, they make it sound as if you purposely didn't say no. Maybe you enjoyed it. Maybe you asked for it. Maybe you liked it. So it was a, it was a terrible experience. It really was. Um, you know, the, the actual abuse is terrible itself, and then you get that. And that's just more humiliating because there's more people watching you. Mm. In the shack, it was just my uncle and I. But in the court, they watch you. Mm. And then there's almost spectators watching you being humiliated. And you have to say all of these humiliating things. Over and over again, you know. It's not like they ask you the same question once. They ask you over and over again. And I think that's what they, I don't know, that's what they try to do. They try to confuse you maybe, I don't know. I, I had tried to find the actual court records, but I wasn't able to because it's so many years ago. Because I'd like to have conversations with them. Mm -hmm. how, how, how do you defend someone that does this? Mm -hmm. how, how do you? We could prove that he was there, we could prove everything, but obviously because I had waited so long, they couldn't prove that he was the one. So they could prove that you were assaulted, but they couldn't prove that he was the yeah. person that assaulted yeah. you. Yeah. And so that means he was not convicted. You no, know, he wasn't. He received a suspended sentence which is just hogwash in my world but you know so if he had come close to me with whatever in whatever time if he had tried anything and you know it wasn't a, it wasn't a win mm. i was told in court that he cried um, before they read the sentence i didn't go back my parents went um, because i think he he had he had realized that this is real you know, some time after I had discovered that he had done it to other people before. Mm. Um, and so he had known that he was guilty of other things as well. So it was a very real sort of, you know, it was, it was scary for him. Mm. But it, he was let go. And I don't know if he did it to more people after that. I don't know if he had stopped. I don't know. Well, I think possibly also you know, if you were the first person to speak out, he mm. would have had no idea about the effect mm. of his of, yeah. of that yeah. on the victims. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Wow, sad. Lynn, that is yeah. such a story. And, you know, it's heartbreaking because a lot of the stories that we still hear about and a lot of the court experiences that we still hear about, I mean, you you know, it's still it's echoed today. It's, it's um, definitely the same. And especially with victims and perpetrators yeah. sort of in the same waiting yeah. area is something I hear. Um, and while we are pushing for, I think in South Africa, specialized sexual offenses mm. courts, um, yeah. it's not enough. It's not no. everywhere yet. It's not enough. I really think that, you know, that, that the government, the MECs of all the provinces, they should speak to people like us. They should speak to people. I, I want them to come and say, Lynn, what do you think you change? Mm. What do you think? Because we've got, and with all due respect, we've got all these experts that write books and we've got experts that do stats. But until you've experienced it, mm. it's a different view. Don't, you know, I think it's great that the police stations have care packs. It's, it's lovely. So when you're a victim, you get a care pack that has clean panties and underwear and suites and just a whole lot of things. And that's really good. That's a step in the right direction, but it's not enough. Yeah. There isn't capacity with our police services. There isn't capacity with our NGOs. So then something isn't right. Mm -hmm. Then something isn't working. But I just, I feel that there isn't, there's, there's all these conferences and talks and seminars, but what are the action points from that? Mm -hmm. If every suburb could just maybe look after that police station in every suburb there must be counselors there must be doctors there must be so imagine every suburb takes care of their suburb in that way and just work together but there's no conversations like that we yeah. do top end things and it's good for media that we do it but there are no action points and i think you know we had a show recently where we were just saying i think one of the issues is is that talking about sex in general, mm. you know, and being blunt again, is so is still so taboo in families, yeah. in communities. And what another survivor was saying was that um, if talking about just sex in general, thinking about it or considering it is a closed topic, and um, it's just almost impossible to bring up the topic of rape. No, totally. And speaking to your parents, you know, at whatever age, because uh, she was, you know, older, much yeah. older when it happened, of legal age mm. when it happened. And she just said, speaking about your parents, about rape is also speaking to them about sex. Yeah. Um, and then there is what you've, what you've done, sort of the embarrassment yeah. and all of that that yeah. comes into it. Um, Lynn, we don't have much time left. But yeah. I wanted to ask, um, you know, for some closing comments. Yeah. So some closing comments on um, child sexual abuse. You know, many of us are parents who yeah. are watching the show. Many of us are women who have been through it. Um, and then possibly also some comments on healing yeah. in terms of you wrote a book a lot of women do. Yeah. Um, so, so writing the book um, in itself was a healing process I think. So I, I did write it in two days but then I just left it because I wasn't, I just I had to get everything out and so I did it in book form but I wasn't quite ready to revisit because there's all that emotions that accompany the editing process and so your editor would say why would you say this and what happened there and so there's I always say that healing is a process mm -hmm. today I feel as if I have I've forgiven him tomorrow I'm angry at him and he's deceased a long time ago but it really is a process and with healing and this is especially speaking to the survivors with healing comes forgiveness but if you can't forgive yourself mm. then everything else is going to be really hard and i took years to forgive myself because i should have i must have i shouldn't have worn this and so the the unforgiveness toward myself is what blackened my heart mm -hmm. and you can't see the light if you can't forgive yourself you can't see the people that actually willing to help you because you're so focused on it's your fault and unfortunately some of our media that's what they're saying they're saying oh you know when i look at some of the comments on on the thread specifically on facebook i'm horrified she asked for it she shouldn't have worn that, her lipstick was too red. And those are very real things and that just
pushes victims away more and more because there isn't much of a safe space. But I think if I can, if I can leave one thing is that going through sexual abuse is, is a trauma on its own and the consequences of going through sexual abuse it does last for a long time. But there's many of us that go through different traumas, it might be domestic violence, emotional trauma, there's lots of traumas. Um, but our trauma really doesn't have to hold us hostage. We are not what happened to us. We, if I was what happened to us, I would have been terrible. Mm -hmm. We are not what happened to us. And we can overcome. And I've got a, someone said, I keep saying in my interviews that we can overcome. What does that even mean? I said it means that whatever you're facing, you can manage, you can overcome. Your past does not have to dictate your future. And I said, take a pen, take a page and just write. Mm. Don't be, you don't have to become a writer, but write how you feel. Sometimes when you write how you feel, it just flows and that in itself is healing. So if survivors don't feel safe to go anywhere at the moment, just write down how you feel mm. until you feel strong enough and then reach out. There are people. I've been inviting people to send me emails all the time because sometimes it's easier to relate to someone that you don't necessarily have to see all the time. Yeah. So it's a safe way of communicating. Um, but you know, for for I explained that I was I was a victim. I'm not a victim anymore, and I'm not a survivor anymore either. I'm an overcomer because I'm standing up. I recognise the trigger moments and. Trigger moments are just horrible. They can take you right back there. But when you recognize it, you're like, okay, this is how you feel today. Mm. Allow yourself to feel like that. Mm -hmm. And then you just move on. Yeah. You know, we can do this. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you Thank so much you. for being here. Thank you for sharing your story and for writing your book and providing space, not just for the story, but for other survivors, yeah. you know, yeah. who are out there and are watching us. Yeah. And on that, we're going to take a short break and we'll be back with more after this. Welcome back. You're still watching The Woman Show. And joining me now via Zoom is Nuran Osman, who is the director of the Ihata Shelter for Abused Women and Children in Cape Town. Nuran, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Lenina, for having us. So, Nuran, we, as we've said, we are speaking about uh, child safety, and especially over the festive season, given that um, there are a lot of parties often where people, to get, uh, people get together. We know that the children are often left to sort of play by themselves, and there's also a lot of drinking, um, drinking amongst, amongst the adults. And as we heard earlier in Lynn's interview, she herself was at a party with her parents here. And in her case, an uncle had actually followed her to the back of the house when she went to fetch a cool drink. And so, you know, when we're speaking about child sexual abuse, I wanted to ask in your work throughout your career, how prevalent is child sexual abuse with uh, the survivors that you've interacted with, um, both children and adults? So Lenina, our focus at the Hata Shelter is to work with abused women. Um, it just so happens that many of them have children and they bring the children along. Um, but in terms of prevalence, uh, we would, I would guesstimate that about 85 to 90 percent of clients um, who come in as, as survivors or victims of gender-based violence were violated as children. Um, some of their children have already experienced levels of violence. So um, I think also we've got to be clear that even when a child witnesses an act of violence, then it is a violation of that child's basic human rights to be safe and to be protected. So yes, I would say it is extremely prevalent and more prevalent than, than we would like. Thank you so much for that, Nuran. And I mean, 80, over 80% 80 is a shocking number. Um, so in the research that we've seen on, on child sexual abuse and just child abuse in general, and I think also with the recent child murders that we've seen, often it has been 
um, shown that children are abused by somebody that they know, and especially when we're thinking about young children. And is this something also that you've seen in terms of your research um, and in your work working with children? I want to say that when we talk about children um, and, and the safety and the, and the well-being of children, I, I want to mention that children are often, and women are most often, violated by people that they know, in the case of women, intimate partners, in the case of children, an uncle, a grandfather, an aunt, a cousin, um, and yes, I am saying an aunt and a cousin and, and using female gender because we often ignore the pink elephant in the room and that's the fact that boy children are also often being violated. Now, I don't have statistics for how many girls and how many boys and then we've got the challenge of reported cases, but girl children and boy children are being violated. And then I want to raise another thing, Lenina, another issue that we are noticing. Children left unattended are often violated by the children. So we must always assume that the perpetrator one is male because it's not always the case. We mustn't also assume that the perpetrator is an adult because that's not always the case. Recently, um, we had a counseling matter referred to us where uh, a four-year-old boy had been sexually violated by a 13-year-old boy. Um, oftentimes, when there are cases like these, then it would, it would seem, and sometimes we find, that the perpetrator, him or herself, was also violated. So leaving children with other ch children doesn't necessarily make them safe. You're raising such important points. And I think often, um, as you said, boy children are left out of the conversation. But when we speak about gender-based violence and, and violence, you know, we speak about child protection, we're meaning boys and girls. And I think that we are seeing, um, I think, an increase in disclosures of male victims of abuse that are showing us even how prevalent that is. So, um, when we look at that then, you know, the question becomes how do we keep our children safe and how do we keep our children safe in sort of, I guess, uh, familial settings, within families, within get-togethers. I think the question is we, we all, we want them to be safe, but what is the alternative to keeping them, keeping the children on our laps like all evening? Are there healthy approaches to child safety that we can take? Yeah. So just to your previous point, Lenina, yes, when we speak about protection, we do mean girl and boy children. However, in the sector, when we speak of the 16 days of activism, which is now just passed, of violence against women and children, often we ignore the boy child. Um, and, and that's the concern that I'm raising. In terms of child safety, particularly now through the holiday time, we know that alcohol and drugs is the enemy of the health of our society. Seriously, if, it, if I had it my way, and I'm not speaking as a representative of my organization, I'm speaking um, from a personal perspective, I wish that alcohol could be banned in this country because so many of the crimes that we witness in our work at the Manenberg um, South African Policing Services at the, at the station where we work in the VIP room, so many of the crimes against women and children um, are caused by by uh, um, by alcohol by the use of alcohol and, and substances. Just yesterday, I was coming to work and driving through the area, and teenage boys are on the corner consuming alcohol publicly, without shame. Just assume children are fine with an uncle, uh, you know, a neighbor, an aunt, and they're not. Um, even with older siblings, even with with cousins, we should not be. Um, leaving children unattended. I, I have young children myself, two of my children are eight and ten. I will not leave them with anyone mm -hmm. um, because oftentimes it's, it's people that we, we know well that violate our children. Um, the other thing is allowing children to play on the street. Yes, it's fine. I mean, we remember when we were children, it was phenomenal. We played in the street with our friends. It was lovely. But if neighbors could share the responsibility, assuming that neighbors are safe people, mm -hmm. um, of watching the children, because so many kids, as you mentioned earlier, are murdered. So many are raped. So many are kill, uh, killed, murdered, sorry. Um, so many are, are kidnapped. So if we could have one adult on the street watch the children and just do hourly shifts as the children play, that, that would be amazing. Also, um, one of the things that I'm, I'm really passionate, passionate about are open community safe spaces like play parks. We should stop allowing, as communities, we should not allow substance users and gang members and all of these antisocial elements to be using our play parks for their recreation. It's meant for children. And so we 
have neighborhood watches in our communities as adults, we should be at those play parks attending to the needs of the children. Um, and yes, it takes a little bit of sacrifice and a lot of patience because children can be quite um, difficult and naughty and misbehaved and things. But the more attention we give to the children, the more we, we sacrifice for their well-being, the safer we can build communities and society. Ludan, I, um, I completely agree with you. And that also speaks to what we often say is that it takes a village to raise a child. And so what I hear that you're saying is that also we need to take some conscious action to understand that there are dangers out there, that no space is safe, completely safe really for our, for our children. Um, and to you know, take a, make a conscious effort to make sure that there are always eyes on the children. And I often I know with one of the with one of the, the recent child murder cases, one of the children, I think that we're seeing actually an increase of children being taken while they are on their way to the house shop around the corner. So even there, just letting them go up the road to be more aware and more conscious of the dangers of that. Um, Nudan, I want to ask your your pro your organization hosts programs and it speaks to building healthier and stronger families. Now, we come from a culture that the children should be seen and not heard. Um, I often say, you know, I, I can also remember, you know, when we sort of in a setting with family, your mom could, would almost shush you before she even knew what you were going to say. Um, so in, in your work in terms of building healthier families, how important is it to build a relationship with your child, to speak to the child, to listen to the child, not necessarily as if they are, you know, a little kid, um, but to just have real conversations with them? So I want to change that and say children should be seen and not hurt. Um, listening to a child is probably one of the most important things that we could do to eradicate the scourge of violence against children. Um, often the children give us signs. I, I once was reading an article about a school-based intervention where a child was coming to school very upset in the morning um, and telling the teacher that, um, and excuse me if this is inappropriate, but I do think it's time we speak about these things as they are. But the, the child, she was an, a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old girl, and she was telling the teacher, my uncle ate my cookie. And she said this every single morning, but she cried. And the teacher said, well, that's not a big deal. You mustn't be greedy. You must share. What she was trying to say was that this uncle, uncle was sexually violating her in an oral way. Now, if we listen to the child, we would, we would see that she's but visibly really upset. So we listen with our ears, with our eyes, with our heart, and then we'll see that the child did not mean that it was a biscuit. It was that she had used the word cookie for genitalia. But you can tell when a child is upset about a biscuit and when a child is upset about a sexual violation, it's a very different upset. Um, the other thing is when children come into a family gathering and we shush them, as you said, um, and we send them away, they may be coming to report danger. They may be coming to report that uncle so-and-so or auntie so-and-so is in the room with the child with the door shut. So um, it, we, we must listen, but it's really, really important also. And in our communities, you know, talking about sexuality and, and sex and those sorts of things, even talking about violence and fights and arguments with children is considered inappropriate. And therefore children stop talking, they stop trusting adults and sharing. And only later in life when, when there's a relationship that's dysfunctional or trauma, um, some, some level of post-traumatic -tra -tra symptom shows up, then we want to say, oh my goodness, something happened in childhood, but it's almost too late. I mean, often with our clients, they cannot find peace and closure because the perpetrator who was an old uncle or an old grandpa or an old auntie um, or an old neighbor has already passed away. But if we had listened and created safe space for those children in when they were young, then they would not carry um, the trauma into, into adulthood. And the one challenge, I think, with many um, incidences of gender-based violence or relationship or marital breakdown is the fact that once you find your loved one and you're vulnerable and you want to form a relationship, that seems to be the space where this trauma shows up. Now, I'm also of the belief that many perpetrators of gender-based violence are in fact victims of gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. I often, when I'm interviewed, say hurt people hurt people. But if we prevent or we heal that hurt um, in childhood, in early adolescence, 
then it creates for a much better, stable, more um, holistic kind of balanced adult who can then have healthy functional relationships. Thank you, Nudan. And, the, and that just makes also so much sense because, um, you know, someone who goes on to, someone who perpetrates those kind of crimes, I mean, any crimes, it's got issues, but um, who perpetrates those kind of crimes also must be sick, if I were to, if I were able to say it that way. And I mean sick as in, you know, they've either got their own trauma or whatever is driving eventually the gender-based violence and is driving the cycle of gender-based violence. Um, I just want to come back to one thing you said, because I, I have a young daughter and young nephews. And so um, I have learned over the years when you're speaking about terminology and you're speaking about the little girl um, and how they are just the words that they are using. So, and in my own home and life, we've started, you know, using the correct words for genitalia. And I have to say, it makes the older population very nervous, very uncomfortable. But can you tell us just how important that is, not just so that we can understand what's happening, but also later as they go through the legal system to be able to describe those things? You know, I pray that children are never forced to go through the legal system having to testify, but the harsh reality in this country is that so many little ones are being violated in a sexual manner. If you stood up in a court of law and you said, my uncle touched my cookie, I am sure defense attorneys can be horrible people when they're defending um, perpetrators of child rights and they can say, no, but the child is talking about a biscuit. But more than that, why should children not know the real names of their body parts. I mean, when you say to a child, this is your ear, you feel no sense of shame. When you say this is your nose, no sense of shame. So why should we perpetuate a psyche of shame when we say these are your breasts, this is your vagina, and this is your penis? Mm -hmm. um, pet names don't serve, but also there's the thing about you've got to be shy about those parts of your body. Those parts of your body are equal to any other part of your body and should be looked after in the same manner. Um, and also, if you're uncomfortable with someone touching your cheek or your hand, it's also your right to say, I don't like when uncle so-and-so. I mean, uh, even in my own family, there was this thing about it was compulsory to kiss adults in the family. And I got into big trouble for it because I said to my children, you only kiss people that you love and that you really want to kiss. So every time we say, go and kiss the uncle, go and kiss the uncle, and they are forced. Next time when the next uncle in the neighborhood says, come kiss me, they feel it's an act of respect and they're obligated. Um, one of the, three of the biggest, not one, sorry, three of the biggest driving forces um, in many of the social issues that we deal with, such as gender-based violence, such as um, substance use disorder, addiction, are blame, shame, and guilt. And so when there's blame, shame, and guilt involved, it perpetuates um, the violation of, of, of basic human rights. For example, the shame that we have when we speak about genitalia, eventually the children learn that this is, this is a body part you don't talk about, even when you experience pain there. Um, and, and so it's um, also the victim blaming story of, uh, you know, they, they don't say my breasts, they say, um, I, you know, your pearls or your whatever people use, I don't even want to know. But then when I talk about it, I must speak about it with shame. And if I'm going to tell someone, that um, my older uncle or my older aunt or my cousin touched the, there's going to be blame, they're going to blame me, I'm, I'm going to be um, put to shame. And then there's the whole feeling of guilt that victims live with, live with. So if we get it right from the beginning and we speak with comfort and ease around body parts, children then learn to become comfortable with their bodies, no fat shaming, no body shaming, um, no, um, you know, there, there's no stigma, there's no discrimination, it is what it is. And then children are comfortable with their bodies. They're comfortable to talk about their bodies. And they're also comfortable to say that I don't like when so-and-so touches my body. I mean, you've raised just like such, such important points, Naran. Um, Can I ask, so, and I'm familiar with that sort of, you know, there's backlash when we're changing, when we're changing a culture. Children are supposed to be obedient, I think, I think all of us have our stories of you get up and you must go and kiss and hug all the aunties and uncles when you get there. And again, you know, even in my own household where, um, and I'll just give an example, we, we, my daughter didn't want to hug uh, my brother and she would say, oh, you know, here's some sweets, 
give me the hug and you'll get a sweet. So even that putting us, I know. <laughs> but you see, for us, that was normal. For us, a lot of the adults would sort of, you know, I, I speak about buying um, love just because there was sort of no healthy, we couldn't speak about it. So a lot of, so a lot of people would show love through luxuries you know, and, and just interrogating those mm. things. And so what I was saying is like, oh, no, please don't teach her to, um, you know, sell hugs and so, you know, and so forth. But, um, and, and I'll ask you, I think in your experience, just working with families, and then also as your experience as a mother, and within a family, what are healthy ways to sort of respond to the backlash from families when we try to uh, when we try to sort of change the culture, and I'm just asking that because I think a lot of women and a lot of mothers will struggle with that. You say you got into a lot of trouble. I think um, yeah. maybe you could just give us a few words to sort of you know really we know this is important. How do we stand strong um, as yeah. parents to be able to to weather this? So, so my children come before, you know, any of my family's disagreement or anything like that. I would rather protect my children than place them in a situation of vulnerability um, where they are forced and later compromised. I mean, one of the things, and I've worked in the healing fraternity in the social sciences for 21 years now, one of the most difficult things to heal is a, is a violation of your um, of your body uh, people really they they learn to live with it but I think it's like death you never quite get over it um, and so I I'm quite assertive about it within my family and I, I said to my children stick to your guns if you're not willing to do it don't do it but it, in families where you know where families are not as dysfunctional one can sit down and say um, and, I, and I really am gonna say it links to a lack of education but one can sit down and say to the elders with the current climate of sexual violence against children, um, what, with the current client of, uh, climate sorry, of child molestation and all of those things, please can you respect my decision to not force my children into any kind of thing? Um, and, I, and I pulled a face when you said your brother, because I grew up like that where grandparents would say, yes, yeah, some sweets for you now, give grandma a kiss here, give, you know, I bet you some cupcakes, give grandpa a hug kind of thing. Um, and it is so damaging because, I mean, one of the things that we also see with the adolescent girls with who we work is that they so easily become taxi queens. And that's the whole phenomenon of young women who get to sit in the front of the taxi driver's vehicle and go around with him all day and bunk school and he buys her a cell phone in exchange for sexual favors. Now, these are older men grooming younger girls, but these are also younger girls who think that it's okay to sell my body um, for commodities. So you create almost a culture, and I'm not necessarily um, speaking out against sex, sex work, but what I am saying is young girls don't choose sex work. You know, they, they are adolescents, they should be happy and fun and playing and have safe spaces. But this culture of taxi queens almost encourages um, the sex worker culture, it encourages them to, to sell their body, themselves, their dignity for, for what they can score, basically. Mm. Um, but we teach that early on in childhood, much the same as we teach ge that gender-based violence is okay. Um, you know, when the boy at school pulls your hair, then um, uh, the, he likes you. Or when the girls at school, you know, come in a group and circle a young boy to touch his genitals, oh, it's because they have a crush on you and you're macho man, you're popular. It's those things that, that kind of create a culture of, of child violation or child protection rights issues come up because we're not critically looking at those things. So I think it's to discuss with family members and say, I'm sorry if you're unhappy with my decision, but this is my decision. I will not force my children um, to show any sign of affection, not even to me as their parent. I mean, you are, I completely agree with you. And it's so interesting because as you're speaking, what I'm thinking about is that that's what we're doing. We're creating, um, we're making affection, affection transactional. Mm -hmm. So there's a transaction there, yes. you know, hugs, um, hugs for sweets or kisses for, you know, cake and so forth. Um, and those sorts of things really became ingrained. Nuran, you know, I could go on forever and have on this topic, but we only have a few minutes left. Do you have, I think, some parting words for communities, for parents, for even aunts and uncles and everyone that's going to be out there with the festive season? 
um, just around child safety? So I want to say that our children are our future. They will teach us lessons. They will teach us how they wish to be treated. They will teach us what we need to go forward to build successful society. I want to say to parents also and guardians of children, treat girl children and boy children equally. We spend a lot of time and focus protecting girl children and worried about the, the violations, sexual and other against girl children. Boy children are equally vulnerable. Um, be sure that when your children speak, that you hear them, that you listen. If you're going to be drinking heavily and all of those things, ensure that the children are safe, please, before you do that. Because in your drunken stupor, your child can be kidnapped, violated, killed, so many things. It's really, really important that both girl and boy children are protected, loved, cared for, and heard. And most importantly, not hurt. Thank you very much, Narayan. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Lenina. And that's all we have for this evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Lenina Rasul. Good night.